Uh, my name is Travis Bradford. I'm a uh, professor here at Columbia University. I teach at the Policy School and the Business School and uh, in the Master's in Sustainability Management program uh, on energy and natural resources, uh, markets, uh, innovations, et cetera. And um, you know, I'm really excited about our panel today, and uh, I think that uh, 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 we're all very fortunate to have uh, a stellar cast of people to talk about the, uh, um, the issues of adapting clean uh, technologies for the bottom of the pyramid and, and there's a scale word scalable in there just just to make it a little bit harder so it's not just adapting them or adopting them it's uh, it's adopting things or adapting things that can quickly have meaningful impact at the bottom of the pyramid and as we talk about a lot about it in in, um, in uh, uh, trying to teach energy systems and energy markets a lot of the challenges that are, are exist all up and down the income distribution are, 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 are often quite similar in their general context. I mean, there's, you've got to have good technologies, you've got to have that are cost effective for the purposes, uh, you've got to have a decent business environment uh, and, uh, and transactional environment in which transactions can take place. Many of them have capital uh, uh, problems because you're looking at technologies that are delivering multi-period, multi-year, in some cases multi-decade benefits. And, uh, and then you've got all kinds of other market failures that can occur. The fact is, is that in many cases, at, at the bottom of the pyramid and in other locations, you've got technologies that, are, that already meet the first test. They're already economic. And in this case, it's probably where the, uh, the bottom of the pyramid has the advantage over the rest of the pyramid in that the value proposition for people for properly financed and properly deployed technologies is far greater at the bottom of the pyramid than it is in other places. Unfortunately, the other challenges are also far greater. And so we've got uh, three of them, the uh, uh, truly amazing uh, folks to uh, uh, talk about the, um, uh, the issues. So uh, we're going to do a, a quick introduction of each of you. Uh, I'm going to let you do the, your primary introductions, um, but the, uh, uh, but the, and then give us a little insight as to how you view the, 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 the challenges and perhaps the opportunities of deploying these technologies and, and, and at a meaningful scale, and given your, your experience and what you do. So first, to my immediate right, uh, Michael San. San? Um, the uh, uh, is a partner at Dahlberg Consulting, and um, he's uh, he's also interestingly an author of an amazing report that I, I would recommend that all of you read, which is Lighting for the Base of the Pyramid. It's a um, it is a really well thought through economic market analysis of how this how 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 to deliver uh, uh, lighting services to the bottom of the pyramid, all the way down to all the different distribution models that you might look at and I, I just from a just from a market structures micro market structures point of view I think it's something that everybody who's interested in the topic should read so uh, M Michael please uh, thank you very much Travis so uh, just a quick uh, quick intro to uh, Dahlberg for those of you who don't know who we are Dahlberg is a strategy consulting firm that focuses exclusively on development issues so we, we are a social enterprise uh, we're a non. Uh, uh, we are a for-profit uh, and thankfully profitable, but we're we are not a profit-maximizing business. We focus on the issues that we believe are going to move the needle uh, with the base of the pyramid or or other issues in the development space. Uh, I specifically work a lot on. Um, I, I do work a lot on energy, but really my my area of focus is models for serving. Uh, the base of the pyramid and for scaling up business solutions for the base of the pyramid. So I work a lot on agriculture, uh, I, I touch on health, uh, on, on water, and on energy. And in the energy space uh, in particular, uh, some of the areas where we've worked, um, we, we, as, as, as uh, Travis has mentioned, we've worked on uh, lighting for the poor. Uh, specifically solar lighting solutions, uh, off-grid decentralized solar lighting solutions uh, in Africa and, and South Asia. Uh, we do a lot of work on clean cook stoves, and we're actually about to uh, publish or, 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 or author a report uh, with the Global Alliance and the World Bank on uh, the clean cook stove space and, and, and business models for transforming that space in the next five to ten years. Um, and I also work on mini grids and um, uh, on LPG, actually with Chris's uh, former colleague on, for the Global LPG Alliance that's trying to scale up LPG for the mass market uh, and, and really for large chunks of the BOP in, in Africa. So I, I wanted to touch on a few challenges overall for the market, uh, a few specific challenges for social entrepreneurs, uh, and then a few, I think, major opportunities that uh, we see on the, on the horizon. 
So starting with the, the overall market, and, and some of these things won't sound new to those of you who've looked at the market, but one big issue, cross-cutting issue that we've seen across all of the clean tech markets for the poor in the developing world is affordability. This is not obviously not surprising, but the affordability bar really is quite quite uh, quite low. Uh, and uh, if you look at the technology that has had the widest spread, right? So people often mention mobile phones. Even mobile phones have only reached about 10 percent or five to 10 percent of the very poor in places like Africa, and, and maybe as much as half of the BOP in in, uh, in parts of Asia. So, and and that's the technology that's had that's had the biggest penetration. If you look at clean tech technologies, the penetration right now in most cases will be less than 1% or just a few percentage points. And of course, the main issue is you know, you're dealing with people whose average household, monthly household income is $150, and you're trying to, uh, you're trying to get them to buy technologies that cost anywhere between 15 or 20 and $100, depending on technology. And with solar home systems would be a bit more. But fundamentally, uh, people don't have that kind of cash to pay up front for these technologies, and they have extremely high discount rates. So even if the technology is economic, um, the fact that you will save $10, $20, $50, $20, two or three months from now actually is worth zero or next to zero to a lot of people because they, they really live on a day -to -day, uh, uh, with a day-to-day -day framework. So second area is consumer awareness. And uh, the, the issue there is that people uh, at the base of the pyramid, they have very little information about the new technologies and about the benefits of these new technologies. And, and secondly, there's a major uh, behavior change challenge in adapting new technologies that people may not be familiar with and may require them to cook slightly differently, to light their home slightly differently, to procure water in a different, in a different fashion. Uh, thirdly, it's finance. Uh, and I'm sure others will touch on this. Uh, obviously, both Acumen and Ianco, this is what they do so well. Uh, but uh, the, the issue is partly finance for the social entrepreneurs that will design these solutions. But really, what we found is the biggest bottleneck is um, uh, finance for the sort of midstream intermediaries, for distributors really in the countries where people are trying to deploy these solutions. Because the international social entrepreneur can actually find capital if they, if they know where to look. The, the, what they don't have the capital for is to, is to pass credit down to the distributors and further down to retailers who really don't have the money to build out local retail networks and who are unable to extend credit down to the consumer. And then lastly, uh, and this is an issue that we see, again, we see persistently, is quality. So there are many very interesting solutions out there. There are very few standards at the bottom of the pyramid. Uh, even, even frankly, for middle-class consumers in a lot of these countries, there are very few standards that are imposed on products. And when you get down to the bottom of the pyramid, there is very little information on what is a good product, what is a poor product. And there are a lot of poor quality products entering these markets. So there's a lot of dumping of poorly manufactured solar lanterns, of very low quality cook stoves. And what that does is it, it actually ruins the market for social entrepreneurs when they come in with a cool new solution that ha happens to be co also called an improved cook stove or, or an uh, improved lantern or, uh, or a um, you know, water purification solution. So a few specific challenges that I think are interesting for those of you who have started social enterprises or want to start a social enterprise or want to fund a social enterprise in the developing world. Uh, the first one is uh, what, what we call kind of technology mania. So focus on, we've got a really cool technology that no one has, as opposed to we've started with an understanding of what the consumer really needs and addressed some very specific issues, maybe not in, in a very high-tech way, but, but appropriate technologies is the big issue, not cool technology. And, and, and sometimes entrepreneurs go wrong with that because they don't start with the consumer. Um, the second related issue is actually the understanding of the consumer. People really don't start with anthropological research or understanding what do consumers in these countries need. They start again with the solution that they have and then they try to adapt it. Uh, thirdly, th the way that people design their business models. One of the main issues that we see is that often entrepreneurs do not design their business models for unit level profitability. So the idea is, you know, we're going to design this incredible business, we're going to lose a lot of money in the first few years, we're going to get a bunch of subsidies, we're going to get a bunch of donor grants, but then as we scale up, 
then at some point down the line, the economics will make sense and the costs will go down. So people are overly optimistic on how costs scale. A and then secondly, they don't realize that if you do not have a clear sense for how your $15 product will generate a 30 or 40% margin, not just for you, but margins across the manufacturer, the distributor, the retailer, so enough margins for everyone in the value chain to actually make this a self-sustaining business model, then the product will probably not succeed or probably not reach uh, sufficient scale. Um, and uh, I think the last, the, uh, the, the last, last point uh, in terms of a challenge I that, that we see is uh, not enough appreciation of the importance of actually building your business on the ground in the developing country. And, and there's some very practical reasons why, for why that is important. So one, uh, for one, uh, import tariffs and duties are very, very significant in, in most countries in the developing world. So in Africa, if you come up with a great product, if you bring it to Nigeria, the product will double in price the moment it lands in the country. And that's before it goes through the distribution value chain. And Nigeria is an extreme example, but that's true in many, many countries across, uh, across Africa. Uh, so three opportunities that I wanted to end on, uh, which I think are interesting and, and may change the dynamic on a lot of these things. The first one is increasing uh, private sector uh, interest and flow of funding into the sector. And just an increasing recognition that these are real markets in a CK Prahala type sense of markets, but, but also it's not that just the potential is there. It, that these are actual markets where people are already spending a lot of money. So as an illustration, the market for uh, solar lighting We've estimated that it's a mar people already are spending about $10 billion a year across Africa for uh, lighting fuel, for largely for kerosene. For clean cooking, people in Africa last year, we estimate spent about $25 billion on uh, a variety of uh, cookstove fuels, everything from LPG, but also really a lot of primitive or, or what, what are traditionally considered dirty fuels like charcoal and wood. So there's a real recognition that there is a market and people already are succeeding. They're the entrepreneurs that we, we see in this market, they're growing at 50 to 150% a year, uh, some of the, the market leaders. They have healthy profit margins. So this market is real and people are recognizing that. Uh, secondly, donors and, and uh, governments are beginning to recognize this. And so you, you see the appearance of an ecosystem of support services for entrepreneurs to help them uh, we provide technical assistance, to provide them with finance, and really to put in the infrastructure around quality standards and other things that these markets need. Um, and then uh, uh, it's on, to, on technology, you see prices for a lot of uh, technology components dropping. You see the performance increasing. So again, there's an, there is a real opportunity to revolutionize technology if you get it right and you focus on the consumer. The, 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 the last thought that I wanted to, to leave you all with is that uh, for those of you who are sort of considering taking the risk and starting a business in the developing world or folks in the developing world, uh, I wanted to highlight that the, there is no incumbent advantage here because there are no incumbents for the most part. If you look at the leak tables of the top sales for solar lanterns, the, top, the, the leading companies for the sales of cookstoves, uh, mini grids, water purifiers, etc., you will not see Philips, you will not see... Siemens, you will not see Bosch, you will not see um, uh, Panasonic, you're going to see social entrepreneurs who are already reaching, in some cases, or have reached several, up to several million people, or, you know, the market leaders we see selling about 500, uh, sorry, 300,000 units or so uh, annually, um, which, you know, it's, it's a drop in the bucket relative to the size of the market, but it's, it's grown quickly. So uh, with that, let me... Uh, yeah, uh, thank you. That, the the um, I, I love structured thinking. Um, the um, that was um, quite comprehensive. We I, we I, I wish we had more time than the than, than allotted here because you brought up a, a, a lot of good points, and so we'll deal with some of those. We can expand on some of those further in the Q and A. Um, the um, the next uh, speaker is Yasmina Zaidman. Um, Yasmina is the director of communications and strategic partnerships, which confused me because those aren't normally next to each other on an organizational chart. Um, but uh, for um, uh, for the Acumen Fund, uh, the, many of you know the Acumen Fund. It is it is really. I think changed the way people think about the type of investing and social impact investing that, that you do. Um, and, and, and I've watched over the last 10 years, sort of as it's developed, it, that it's really become um, you know, a, a, a leader in forming the language and synthesizing the notion of, 
of um, uh, of, of welfare and 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 profits and well-being in a, in a very sophisticated way to the extent that that your founder even ended up on the uh, cover of uh, Forbes magazine. Were, were you involved as the director of communications for that? Congratulations. The um, anyway, um, um, Yasmina, if you'd like to take yeah, it away. Absolutely. Thank you. Um, well, it's a, it's a privilege to be here, and as you heard in my title, energy is not in the title, but um, I have already learned so much. I think for Acumen Fund, we do our learning from our investing, and because our position within this very, very quickly expanding impact investing space is definitely around um, this role of, of innovating and catalyzing enterprises that we think can mature into sustainable businesses that do attract different forms of capital, we really put a high premium on this idea of innovation and taking risk. And so some of the issues and challenges that Michael raised are the ones that the entrepreneurs we work with face every day. Um, I just. Uh, Personally, I remember 14 years ago, I was visiting with an Ashoka fellow in Zimbabwe who was a farmer um, named Zephaniah. He uh, was about 75 years old and was really um, a, a true innovator in the agriculture sector. He had managed to find a way to manage water resources on his farm such that his water tables had risen to a level that allowed him to have crops that were two or three times more productive than his neighbors. And he was starting to figure out how to teach this technology. So here I was in the middle of rural Zimbabwe with this incredible innovator. He'd had thousands of visitors. He'd been written about. There's now been a book written about him. But when the sun went down, it grew dark. There was no access to grid electricity there, and even household lighting technologies. Honestly, I think the only light we had was from the cook fire that he had. He didn't have a cook stove. And I think about that now because I feel like when we talk about energy, it's easy to sort of create this singular lens and this notion that clean technology is going to be kind of the answer. Um, I think access to energy can be one of those things that truly is catalytic in helping people get out of poverty. It's closely linked, obviously, to health benefits, to productivity benefits, um, and even to educational benefits. But the thing I would love to kind of underscore my comments with in today's session with is the need for innovation at every level. Um, that, that one product, one business solution isn't going to be enough. And that's certainly what we're seeing in our energy portfolio. So Acumen Fund, as uh, many of you probably know, is uh, a nonprofit social venture fund. But really, our mission is to change the way the world tackles poverty. So it's nice to hear that, that people feel that that change is starting to happen, um, particularly around the role of entrepreneurship. So in addition to investing in businesses, we also invest in leadership, and we invest in the spread of ideas. Um, and I guess within our energy focus, we've really thought about how can we find that next generation of businesses that are unlocking some of these challenges. We've been investing in energy since 2007. We've invested about $7.5 million in six different companies. Um, and it's one of our fastest growing portfolios. So while it's a, it's a modest portfolio compared to uh, a traditional commercial fund, what we're seeing is companies that are willing to innovate at every level as they scale. Um, so I want to share just a couple of examples, because again, that's where our learning comes from. Um, one is a company called Husk Power Systems. Uh, it's based in Bihar, which is one of the poorest states in India. Um, and in fact, if it were a country, it would be among, I think, the four or five poorest countries in the world. Um, it's, it's a part of India that in some ways has been left behind. So an entrepreneur who grew up there, Gyanesh Pandey, um, but had the opportunity to get an education in the United States focused on um, electrical engineering, uh, decided to go back to Bihar and focus on an issue that he felt was really fundamental to Bihar's development. Um, he had to figure out a way to create a sustainable, uh, affordable source of energy. And what he saw was that in a state like Bihar, which is a rice producing state, that they had this waste material in the form of rice husks that was not being utilized. And so he worked for years to develop a technology to convert rice husks into uh, electricity through gasification process and started thinking about, well, how do you distribute that energy? How do you create a low cost system to get the energy from a small plant into people's homes? And literally they used you know, bamboo poles um, and wires to bring the electricity to homes um, serving the needs of a village. So a typical household for about $2 a month can have access to um, usually a, a light and maybe one other um, appliance, maybe a fan or a television. <coughs> So it's really been transformative in the communities where it's working, and it's started to spread. But the story for me that's exciting about Husk is, again, the story of innovation at every level. Um, he started out with financing from his own personal 401k plan. He entered into a few business plan competitions. Um, there'll be a business plan competition judging later today that I'm a part of, so you never know where those things can lead. Um, and then early on, got some grant funding from the Shell Foundation, who's also very committed to energy issues and uh, was able to begin to prototype this approach with a lot of trial and error. 
when we first learned about him, we knew he was a ways away from being able to be ready for an Acumen investment. Uh, but what we did is followed him, tracked him, um, kind of observed, but also gave some input into what we saw as some of the challenges. And by the time he had three or four plants, we felt like we were ready to put some capital in. So we invested, um, and shortly after saw a few other investors come in. Um, I think since we've invested, the IFC has also come in, and we've started to see this ramp up. So they're now providing electrification to over 300 villages and over 10,000 people. And we think that this model is really on the way, not only with a, a technology innovation, but also thinking about distribution models, innovation in terms of how he's accessing capital. And one of his biggest challenges now is actually finding the talent pool to staff these facilities. Um, again, he's working in remote rural parts of Bihar. He's not going to be importing human resources. So he needs to find people in the communities that are actually able to operate a plant to follow the protocols to assure health and safety. And so he's actually had to create a university that allows people to get the basic level of education that allows them to work effectively with his company. He didn't set out to start a university, but again, in order to meet the needs of a company that is scaling, he's had to innovate at every level. Um, so I think the, the story there, and I might just save other examples for later because I know we've got um, a lot to cover, is that when you go into this process of creating scalable technologies, whether it's in energy, water, we also work in health, um, agriculture, you start out thinking about a particular problem but what you encounter is a whole suite of other challenges. And I think what's really required in successfully delivering these solutions at scale is that willingness to continually innovate, to find alliances and partnerships that recognize what it is you're trying to do, and also not to try to go it alone, to recognize that other partners, whether it's financing partners, technology partners, distribution partners, are going to be critical to building a scalable solution. Um, I guess another company that probably those of you who are interested in energy for the BOP already know about, D-Light, again, I think is one that continues to innovate, continues to learn, particularly as they expand into new markets. This is a company that provides solar lighting technology. Um, they're not wedded to one product. In fact, they continuously develop new products, and they now have the cheapest LED light, um, I believe, on the market now for $8. Um, they've innovated around, oh, there's one. Very nice, very, very lean. Um, they've had to completely revamp their distribution model. Um, they've um, had an expansion of their, their management team. They brought in a seasoned CEO, which is another really interesting story about transition from founding entrepreneurs to developing professional management teams. Um, and so the lesson for us with every company, but particularly in the energy field, is those entrepreneurs that succeed are the ones who are unafraid of change, unafraid of adapting, um, and are willing to confront these challenges, which might come from a completely unpredicted direction. Um, so again, that's, that's, those are the stories I wanted to share, but excited to hear some of your questions and your questions as well. Wonderful. Thank you. Um, the, um, it's good to, hear, good, good to hear some success stories every once in a while. There, there are many, it's, um, and I, I think they, they um, but the, the, then, then I guess they present a new challenge, which is how to, how to scale them up, and we'll talk about that perhaps in a minute. Um, the, um, m m the third speaker we have is uh, Chris uh, Aiden. 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 Um, the, uh, he's the CEO of Ian Co. And Ian Co. Is, um, uh, uh, is, uh, has been around for a long time. It's almost 20 years. Uh, and uh, and I have funded hundreds of organizations uh, around the world uh, and has, um, and has uh, uh, focused on a new strategy around uh, doing um, energy investments in Africa, sort of constraining both, I guess, the technology and uh, and and the region for maximum impact and and um, so Chris, I'd love to hear your 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 thoughts and and background on on Ianco, but 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 specifically, I'm interested as to why you've chosen this new strategy. There clearly you've decided it because it's the best one, um, and 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 I want to understand in your mind why is why is energy the best sort of course of action? Why do you find that to have the most impact? And and perhaps why Africa, given that it has some grand challenges associated with it, but I'd love to hear, hear all, all of your perspectives. So that's a compound question. It, it, yeah, well, there's lots of commas. Thank you. Thank you very much, Travis. Um, and good afternoon, everybody. As Travis said, Inco is, uh, is one of the old time impact investors. It was started by the Rockefeller Foundation uh, with the notion that one way to address poverty in the world was to provide, find ways to provide the poor with clean, affordable energy. Uh, and that that mission led to the development of a, of a business model and a strategy, which was to invest in small businesses close to the bottom of the pyramid, let local people figure out the solutions, very much like the stories that Yasmina, um, the story that Yasmina told. Um, 
at its peak, uh, E Co had approximately 180 investments in 90 companies in 20 countries on three continents. The, um, the transformation that Travis mentioned is, was not a transformation of choice. In fact, what's happened is that E Co uh, reached a bit of a uh, financial crisis this year. <laughs> Uh, and as a result of that, um, we've gone through uh, a rebirthing of the organization, which we completed this month. In that process, Co will be um, uh, shedding its portfolios uh, in Asia and Latin America, and we'll focus on Africa. Uh, and, and solar will probably be our primary focus, although we still have investments and an interest in LPG gas as a substitute for wood fuels and efficient cookstoves. But that, that metamorphosis is probably not what you want to hear about today, although I'd be certainly happy to talk to any of you about it. Uh, but we will, we will adopt a different form. We will take the form of a, of a B Corp, a business corp that's mission driven, not profit driven. Uh, and we will run ourselves like a professional fund, although primarily dedicated to the mission, not to making profits. So let me leave that. And we will start with a portfolio of 30 investments in, uh, in in solar, LPG, and efficient cookstove companies in East and West Africa, working out of our offices in Accra and Dar es Salaam. So let me talk about, first of all, I want to say I agree with everything Michael said. He's exactly right. And anything I say that's inconsistent with what he said, you should just assume that I'm not well informed. <laughs> but starting from the way we think about the market uh, in, for solar in Africa at the bottom of the pyramid, it's a, the first thing I think is it, that you have to accept is and I, think, I hope you'll agree with me, data is very hard to come by. So everything's an estimate. And, and, and frankly, we, we rely a lot on the anecdotal evidence, on our own experiences in this, in this broad portfolio that Ianco's had. But if you take the World Bank estimate that there are 100 million households in Africa that are b not connected to the grid, uh, they're burning kerosene, um, and you figure the average household at the bottom of the pyramid. Now, not everybody who's off the grid is at the bottom of the pyramid, mind you, but the average household is spending about $6 a month on, a kerose on kerosene for a lantern. A lot of them have mobile phones, and they're charging them somewhere. They're going down the street to a, a shop, or you know, a friend of my daughter's at college and bought a diesel generator and sent it to his uncle in Gambia, and he sells charges in his, uh, in his local community. So there's more, there's more money in the, in the energy market. Uh, but if you think about just that market, and you assume everybody's at the bottom, and they're not. They're middle class farmers. They're teachers. They're other civil servants who are living off the grid all over countries like Tanzania. That's a market that's got a market size of about $700 million a year. So I like your numbers. But we focus on that, and we say, OK, that's not a bad market to focus on. Um, it's something to work with. Before, um, I want to talk a little bit about the technologies, because I do think they're worth talking about. But I want to first talk a little bit about how we look at the market from our own experience and where we see the barriers to success. Um, and again, I'm going to focus on solar for now. Uh, and it's, it, um, I'm going to talk about it as a market and not about individual entrepreneurs who've hit their head against the wall and broke the wall instead of their heads. It, all, I don't want to take anything away from any of that, but looking at the market, in our experience, we've seen uh, two sort of basic kinds of barriers to um, scaling, distributing solar at the bottom of the pyramid. The first is consumer acceptance, and I think Michael talked about this a little bit. And the second is, is uh, what I would just broadly call non-consumer barriers. So the consumer barriers, the one Michael identified, cost of entry is certainly key. Now, we, we have invested in 10 uh, solar companies in Tanzania that um, retail and distribute and install home solar systems for people who, by Tanzanian standards, are in the middle class and live off the grid. Um, some of them are prosperous enough that they can buy a big enough system that they run an LED TV and a couple of lights and charge their phone and a radio and stuff like that. Um, but to get down to the bottom of the pyramid, or as close to the bottom of the pyramid as possible, um, you really need to find ways to eliminate that cost of, of entry. So essentially, you need to come up with a financing model of some kind, financing or leasing model. Um, the other consumer barrier, frankly, uh, and again, Michael referred to this, as I said, he's right about everything. Um, 
is product quality and failure. It's really two different things that I put in the same category. There are serious product quality problems in the market. And I think in terms of standards, you're absolutely right. Um, there's an issue with standards. Tanzania has a standards board. They'll get around to it eventually. But, but there's also, uh, I was in Mwanza, Tanzania, and one of our companies showed us solar panels that he got that were built by a Chinese manufacturer and had a US manufacturer's label on them. All kinds of things going on in the market. When those systems are installed and they break, what happens in the community is if some first mover household buys one of these systems installed and it break, breaks, that's it. Nobody else in the community is going to buy a solar system. Um, they all think it's a problem. And they, that, that one family has lost so much money relative to their annual income that it, it poisons the community. The other problem, frankly, is, is, is somewhat different. But you get to the same result, which is product failure. And, uh, um, from overuse or lack of maintenance. Maintenance of these systems isn't that complicated, but there's a little bit. And, and we've, we've seen whole batches of products that people say don't work, and there's a very simple problem to fix. But the other problem is when, when I guess it's all anecdotal, not statistical about who's going who's gonna to be adapt this, this um, technology, but um, households that have bought home solar systems in Africa tend to use as much electricity as they can possibly suck out of the system and tend to expand the system, add more panels, as quickly as they can afford to do so. Um, that's, a general, that's a general statement that all of, our, all of our entrepreneurs tell us. The problem is um, you can burn out a system. You can overuse the battery very easily. And they're all usually lead-acid batteries. There's not very much else in the way of technology in the market on a widespread basis yet. And if you, if you overuse a lead acid battery, you kill it. And so the useful life of the battery will be reduced to a fraction. System breaks. The homeowners say, this doesn't work. It was a waste of money. And there you go. You've poisoned the community again. So, so the cost of entry and the failure problems really need to be solved to have this technology take off. Even if you solve those problems, there's a whole host of other problems that, that um, the non-consumer barriers that make doing business in Africa a real challenge. The infrastructure is, um, let's just say it's poor. Um, there's no real access to capital, meaningful working capital. So um, as Yasmina, as Yasmina uh, pointed out, um, about two-thirds of Ianco's portfolio is actually working capital. It's the kinds of loans that commercial banks would have made to small businesses here in the United States. That's what, that's what people did. They needed to buy inventory. Um, Solving those problems um, in a big way is something that's required. Uh, the, other, the other problem, and I do a lot of work in these countries, so I don't want to accuse anybody of everything, but is the C word. Does anybody know what the C word is, what I'm referring to? It's one of the biggest problems in, in developing in any emerging market. Corruption. Sorry? Corruption. Yes. So you can't, and, and I'm not talking about, you know, at the president's level, but you, you can't move almost anywhere through many of these countries without uh, a little bit being chipped off. And um, there's a huge, it's a huge problem. And it's even more complicated than that. In some of our markets, um, we have excellent entrepreneurs who are competing with um, folks who have an inside track. Somebody's got a finger on the scale somewhere in the system. And those people aren't really interested in really developing these markets. They're interested in their own prerogatives, their own control of market share, not size of market. So that's a huge problem. And then the last thing, and again, I think um, both of you have referred to this, is you know, execution is everything. You can have great models, great spreadsheets. It can look really fabulous. And um, it's all that blocking and tackling you have to do at the end. So if I haven't overstayed my, my speech, I can talk for a few minutes about what I think the technologies are, or we can come back to it. OK, so as, we, as we've. Um, uh, in our new incarnation as persistent energy partners, we've sort of taken and really tried to understand the markets, where they're going. How can we take, uh, instead of um, seeding a bunch of businesses and hoping they'll grow, how can we take and build engines of growth? So as we look at the solar market, we see three different models uh, that are being driven by, um, that their core actually is probably one scalable technology, but there are different ways of putting it to use. So the first um, is, is I simply call pay-as-you-go solar. So one way of addressing the initial cost of a system, obviously, is to, is to sell it on credit. 
Um, the problem with selling it on credit is, um, you know, it's on somebody else's house. How do you collect payments? How do you foreclose? How do you do all those things? Well, technology has allowed us, I think wasn't, did anybody go to the um, presentation Simpa Networks was at? Um, Simpa is one of these models where there's, there are technologies that are being developed where you can um, install a home solar system in rural Africa, you can put a meter on it and it can be locked and then uh, the customer can, uh, through M-Pesa, if they're in East Africa, or buying a, buying a scratch card like any other, like the way I, my mobile phone's in Africa, I buy $10 worth and I scratch it off and punch in the code. You can do that and unlock your, your meter and run your solar system. And so that's a way, that's a way that a seller can finance a system. And there are m several models uh, under development right now, several technologies we've looked at. Uh, well, maybe we've looked at all of them, I don't know. We look at any of them that we can see, and, uh, and we're going to invest in a couple of them with a focus, again, since our focus is on the ground, with a focus on how do you actually take that technology and deploy it in the markets that we're active in. Uh, obviously, that solves the upfront cost problem, and it somewhat solves the um, failure problem because the vendor has an interest in making sure the system continues to operate at least until it's paid for. So you know that somebody's going to be watching over that family making sure that system works. The second approach that we're seeing develop in the market, which is also very interesting, is essentially, we call it a utility model, um, selling the solar electricity that comes off of your house. So under this model, um, the company will come in, put a solar system on your house, it'll also be locked, similar kind of payment technology. Um, and you'll buy the electricity in your house off of the roof as you can afford it. You never buy the system, you just buy the electricity. The vendor owns the system at all times. Uh, so it really is like, it's like Con Ed. Um, and the nice thing about that model is the homeowner never ever has to worry about the system. It's the system is the problem of the vendor. It's a very interesting model, we think it's quite scalable. We've seen um, a pilot project for one, of one company that um, is doing this on a $6 a month um, uh, financial model. So in other words, the, the household is, is paying $6 a month for electricity off of this system and the pilot seems to be working just fine from a business model standpoint. The third model that we're seeing are various kinds of mini grids. So, um, you know, one could build a giant solar farm somewhere in sub-Saharan Africa and run high tension lines all over the place and that would be one way to solve the, the energy problem in Africa and I think nobody in this room would think that's a good idea for a whole host of reasons. But mini grids, distributed energy is obviously a, a solution that can work on many levels. Um, one, of the, one of the models that, that we have seen a couple of companies and these are companies we're also investing in. Um, have built community grids and we've seen two different models. One where you actually have a little bit like Husk Power, you have a power station and then you, you wire the community and you sell the electricity. Um, this, the other model is, is actually, a, it's distributed energy within distributed energy. It's a, it's a mini grid system that's actually doesn't have a power plant. It has solar panels placed all around the village that are then wired and, and then it's load balanced as it delivers power to houses as they need it. And uh, very, very interesting, very, very interesting technology and done very inexpensively, which is what's very exciting for us. Um, so again, we think that's an exciting model. Uh, we still have investments in companies that are simply retailers and installers of home solar systems. We're working with local um, uh, credit unions like the Teachers Credit Union and the Agricultural Un Credit Union to find ways to work with them to finance individuals buying those systems. There's it's an emerging market and many of these models could be successful in many different parts of, um, of East and West Africa. Um, but right now, as I said, I think the key to success isn't so much the invention, the technology. I think the technologies are actually not that complicated. It's the ability to execute and scale. Wow, gosh, all that <clears throat> just makes me think that a moderator is completely extraneous for this panel. <laughs> Um, the, um, uh, thank you. Uh, I, I do have one quick follow-up question because it, it comes up a lot that there's a difference between people's demand, you know, final demand for these, these products, whether, whether the business models that are for, 
you know, personal consumption or direct consumption of the benefits, whether it's the light or the electricity for charging or whatever it is, um, versus people who are using it as a micro enterprise, um, sort of uh, almost an, an, a, uh, an industrial tool, right? They're using it as a way to create product for other people um, in a micro enterprise way. Just because I don't know, what what do you think the proportion in terms of the de the uh, the deployments? I know you also fund people slightly further back in the supply chain, but those aside, in terms of the 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 first con the first local consumption, if you will, of the is it is it is it primarily consumer based or is it primarily people who are doing? Historically, it's primarily uh, uh, institutional commercial. Uh, you're absolutely right. Our most successful uh, companies in Tanzania. And they tried to do more um, uh, residential, and um, there just wasn't, they couldn't make enough profit doing it. And so they made tenders for, for government projects, hospitals, schools, uh, businesses, uh, that sort of thing. And uh, one of the reasons we like these models is because when we started to study where our entrepreneurs have been over the last 10 years, we realized how seriously they had migrated away from residential. And so these new models are really intended to be new ways to approach that market. Hmm. Um, the um, so uh, y there's a lot of of um, uh, uh, interesting insight in in what you all have said. There's also interesting insight in what you haven't said because almost none of you talked about policy um, as a support for what you've done. You're, you're all you've all gone through extraordinarily detailed and well-informed uh, sort of economic business model technology and policy really didn't come up in much of what anybody said and and so we all know that there's a long I mean people have known that solar energy uh, you know uh, it, for locations whether the, it was thermal or, or, or electric and and other technologies were were value-added that this they had a customer value proposition for a long time even when as was mentioned, I think, in the panel here earlier, when, even when it was $76 a watt instead of $0.76 cents a watt, right? There was still a value proposition. It's better today. That's, that's, that's good. The, um, but um, we also learned that, there, that through the ways that we, that we as a global community attempted to, de to support the deployment of these things, that you can put too much fertilizer on the field in some sense. You can, you can, you can rain helicopter modules on, down on places, and while they may work for, for a, a, a weeks or months or even years if you're really fortunate, it actually can have some pretty, pretty deleterious effects on the local market. And the World Bank's done years of study trying to review kind of what's worked and what hasn't. And so there's a whole literature on that. But the, um, I guess, n knowing now what we may not have known then, and, and knowing the challenges that we're all facing at the, uh, you know, in the business model development and deployment, what recommendations would you make about policy interventions that would be helpful to what, to what you see are the, the opportunities in overcoming the challenges um, going forward? So we can get everybody's perspective on that. Maybe I, I can start uh, com by commenting on that. So, so I actually just uh, spent a lot of time going around Africa talking to energy ministers uh, and, and, and renewable uh, um, uh, renewable energy departments, rural electrification uh, uh, leadership ac across a number, a good slice of Africa. And, um, and, and, and also talking to a lot of entrepreneurs, both in the cooking context and the lighting context. And the interesting message from entrepreneurs is often all they want is for the government to get out of the way. That's sort of the, the biggest message, and, 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 uh, uh, but the more nuanced story around policy, I mean, I think there are two or three levers that, that do matter. The first one uh, is about getting out of the way, and that's in terms of the way import duties are designed and deployed. And, and people will deploy import duties with the intention of protecting domestic industry, which in many of these, in many of these sectors does not exist, but also it actually, the way that they're designed, actu it actually impedes the development of domestic industry. So by preventing the import of components to allow the creation of domestic assembly uh, and domestic replication of these technologies, they're actually keeping a lot of these technologies out of the country. So one is around import duties. The second one, as, as Chris was mentioning, is, is actually around standards, because there is a role for government in standards. Um, and and in, in, it's in terms of harmonizing standards with the global standards that are already coming up for some of these technologies. So there's a new ISO standard that was just adopted uh, for uh, improved cook stoves about a few months ago. Uh, there is a 
very good standard that was developed by the World Bank, GIZ, and others for uh, solar lighting. There are standards for solar home systems, and, and there are some ideas around standards for mini grids. So there is a role, uh, there's a policy role there. And I think those are probably the two vectors where governments can actually make a difference. And the third one is around subsidies for alternatives to clean energy that are screwing up the market. Uh, and the big one is the subsidy for kerosene. So in markets where kerosene is heavily subsidized, it creates all kinds of distortions and it's highly regressive. There are all kinds of issues uh, w with, with kerosene subsidies, but it also ruins, in some cases, the business case or undermines the business case and creates a lot of unpredictability for, for instance, the solar lighting market. Yeah, and I would just add to the, the subsidy point, um, I think subsidies can kind of work both ways. You can subsidize a, a subpar competitor to an entrepreneurial product uh, that's coming into the market but you can also subsidize some of these ventures themselves and finding ways to do that that don't um, artificially prop up a business model that maybe isn't um, solid enough to stand on its own feet is obviously not what you want to do. But in the case of, of Husk, essentially what they figured out was that in order to make the energy affordable um, to rural communities in Bihar, that some of the capital cost of these plants did need to be subsidized. And the government, I think, in, in the state um, did feel a sense of accountability to providing electrification, and that's been a lot of efforts across India to provide electrification. And it's just an issue of, you know, how quickly can they achieve their goals, and how difficult is it for them to reach some of these areas using traditional means. So in the state of Bihar, the government had actually issued a statement saying that these particular regions where Bihar, where Husk seeks to be active, were economically impossible to reach using traditional um, energy models. And so they were willing to partner with Husk to provide some subsidy, um, having seen the ability of this particular company to really stay with the course, um, provide the, the energy on a reliable basis. So I think those opportunities are out there. We've seen it with a couple other businesses in our portfolio and other sectors. But I would say that, you know, again, it kind of starts with the entrepreneur being able to really flesh out the business model, figure out how it's going to work, and carefully identify where the role f of subsidy is, as opposed to starting out with this sort of comfortable cushion of subsidy um, and never really being able to figure out, well, where are the market gaps and what's the best way to create a viable business model? So that's the approach that we've seen, where the entrepreneur sort of begins, develops the business model at a unit level, and then says, look, if this is really going to fly and scale, here are the pieces that need to be subsidized, and here's a way to do it that will con encourage the business to continue to operate in an effective way. Um, but yeah, I think subsidies can definitely cut both ways. Um, the other issue, I think, is generally just in terms of rule of law. Um, this issue of corruption, obviously, is widespread. But um, another issue that we see, particularly with companies that have franchise models, is challenges around contract enforcement. So if you are going to be working with distributors, if you are going to be working with franchisees, you need to know that you can have an agreement. And essentially, that if there are fees that are due to you based on your investment of capital in this micro-entrepreneur or franchisee, that that capital will come back to you. Um, and we've heard stories before of just saying, look, we know that despite our agreements, um, the money is there, but it's ending up in someone's pocket. And there's really nothing we can do because they're, they're operating in a complete vacuum when it comes to um, sort of rule of law. And, and you know that's just a bigger, broader issue, but it's one that really impacts entrepreneurs that are trying to build networks of businesses that they can operate in this, in this space. So again, I think for government to recognize the importance of contract enforcement, of rule of law, of easy access to, to um, some sort of recourse can really encourage an environment where a whole ecosystem of entrepreneurs can emerge to sort of address this whole range of issues. Wow. The problem with going last is now there are three different subjects I could talk about. Travis's first question about policy, the issue about subsidies, both of which I have strong views on, and the third about rule of law. And I came to Ianco after 30 years in private practice and have actually engaged in enforcement proceedings, so I have some views about that too. But I don't want to be a hog, so let me, let me answer Travis's question. I take it with policy you also were referring to regulation. And I think um, rather than give you sort of my view, I'll give you my picture in my mind is how I think of markets that we work in. And so take Tanzania and Ghana. Now, Ghana is a very um, robust country. The growth rate last year I think was 15 percent. The per capita income is in the thousands of dollars as opposed to Tanzania where it's in the low hundreds of dollars. Ghana, um, the, the Ministry of Energy claims that the country is 73 percent electrified. Although it turns out that what that means is there's a power line going by your house and you have to pay for the connection and you may have to pay for the poles to get to your house if the, if the connection is far enough away. So in fact, 
we don't have good statistics about how many people are actually on the grid in Ghana. Um, but the ministry said to us, well, the only real mini-grid solutions we need in Ghana are the island communities uh, that are part of the country that are off the coast. And we're going to regulate those um, through the Public Utilities Regulatory Commission, which is, uh, which is their uh, national utility regulator. Then go to Tanzania, uh, where uh, Tanzania has, uh, it frankly has an NGO culture. Um, I, uh, I was really, I, I, I actually almost sort of cringed when Paul Farmer told the story about the little boy who said he wanted to work for an NGO when he grew up, because I'm afraid that most of the children in Tanzania feel the same way. And it doesn't have the, uh, we, we had this joke at one point with one of our problem countries that we really needed a Kenyan to come and run it because Kenyans are much more entrepreneurial. So that culture is a bad thing. But what, what is good about Tanzania is it's very open. And uh, the government isn't, uh, isn't attempting to uh, apply its uh, regulatory, uh, its, its utility regulatory commission statutes to many grids that, um, that our companies are working on. And that's going to give us the ability to develop those companies successfully and, and hopefully to scale them. Uh, but at some point, I see, um, to Michael's comment, that what local entrepreneurs want is for the government to just get out of the way. I see a, a, a potential risk that, uh, that they will want to assert themselves. Um, maybe because of the C word, people will see um, an opportunity to make some money. Uh, maybe it's simply a, a, a matter of sound policy that one should have control over one's utility, you, one's power system in the country. But you take Tanzania and Ghana, we're putting our efforts into Tanzania because we really think we can reach people, we can get to more homes uh, than trying to negotiate through the labyrinth uh, of the regulatory system in Ghana. Our hope is that if we prove the models in Tanzania and we prove that they can scale, we can go to the ministry in Ghana and say, we need exceptions, we need something, whatever, so that we can do this here as well. Yeah, that's great. The, it's fascinating because if, if, if I were to ask that same question at almost any event in the, so in, in the U.S. or Europe uh, for um, at any given solar or wind or biofuels or storage conference, essentially they would all say more free money. Um, and none of you actually thought that more free money was the, was, was the binding constraint here. And part, of the, part of the problem is that the actual per kilowatt hour cost of electricity in, in, in Africa is so high. So you don't need that subsidy to, to and you're, the infrastructure here in the United States, there's a fossil fuel infrastructure that uh, exists, and you have to build a solar infrastructure to compete with it. Somebody's got to pay that upfront cost. You're, it's, a le it's more of a level playing field in Africa. Yeah. The um, okay. Well, I'd love to see what you guys want to talk about for the remainder of the time. So, um, and there's some questions. There's a mic coming around, and we'll let. Um, good afternoon. Thank you very much, all of you, for sharing your time and opinion with us. Um, you spoke about the Conhurst in India, and then a bunch of things in Africa. My question is, why is there not is there not um, innovators in Africa using Conhurst? Essentially, seems to be biogas. Um, or I'm not sure, but it sounds like it. Why is there not, I know there's a lot of biogas happening in India. Why is there not, or is there not innovators in Africa or elsewhere kind of having similar ideas that can be fronted, can be brought to scale to provide um, economic development and, and energy for both households in terms of cooking and lighting? company that Yasmina described, um, we've talked with them about supporting them when they're ready to come to Africa, uh, and we hope that they do. Uh, we ran a program last year where um, our, our African solar entrepreneurs from both East and West Africa went to India for a week to look at um, solar deployments and businesses in, in India. So I think there is, there is uh, a fair amount of that going on now, and I think, uh, again, there as, as once you get to scalability, once you get to models that work that are actually being built, then I think you'll see a lot more cross fertilization. Yeah, no, I think that's. Uh, I think that's absolutely right. Um, and and uh, I mean, part of the reason that you see a lot more innovation uh, with these models and a lot of these things st will start in, in in India and often then then later come to Africa is because. A lot of the technology, um, I mean, there's more of an industrial base for manufacturing these technologies at a, in a low-cost way uh, in India. And, and often the technology in Africa will either be imported from India or replicated from India or, or will come from, mo most often will actually come from China. 
Um, but but I think that's not to say that there, there, we, we do see a lot of interesting innovation uh, in Africa, and often it's not going to be innovation around technology per se, but it's going to be innovation around business model. Mm -hmm. um, and, and we're seeing that more and more with uh, everything from Gio Akali, base of the pyramid, business models in East Africa, in, in Kenya and Tanzania, to, um, to, to, to some entrepreneurs uh, coming back to Africa after spending time getting their educations in the U.S. or in the West and, and, and trying to start new models. Yeah, and I just want to add, uh, Chris talked about the particular business model of sort of pay as you go. Um, and we recently invested in a company called MCOPA that is, again, leveraging D-Lite technologies in terms of the products and M-PESA, which is an existing sort of mobile payment system, to create a unique product that has this ability to turn off and on the actual product um, based on mobile sensing. So I think that innovation is definitely happening, and it's building on the platform of other innovative models that are coming both from within Africa but also from outside of it. What else? Please. Chris brought very briefly that uh, you guys are planning on becoming a B Corp. Mm -hmm. And uh, that like, is one of the most monumental movements I think is happening in this sector right now, is opening up the, the possibility to legally pursue mission uh, over and above shareholder value. And that's going to expand the sort of the possible scope of social entrepreneurship so much. I was wondering if you could quickly just speak to the, the business reasons and, and just the organizational reasons you had for taking that step. Sure. Uh, I, I, think, I think if you look at the uh, E&Co's structure today, E&Co is a 501c3, a U.S. nonprofit. If you looked at how it funded itself and operated, um, very little of its revenue came from U.S. donors who needed to take tax deductions. It was a very, very small percentage of the revenue, not significant. So when we and our creditors looked at how to restructure the organization, one of the conclusions that we came to was it's not necessary to be a nonprofit. Certainly nothing wrong with being a nonprofit theoretically, but frankly our creditors had a real problem with it because they said nonprofits tend not to have the kind of um, uh, governance and, and DNA that our creditors wanted. Our creditors were impact investors and development finance institutions, and although they're all interested in development, they still want the business to act like a business. They want the business to act like a business and you can make the decision whether or not to take more profit or not when the opportunity arises. That's the mission decision. But you have to do a good enough job to have that decision. So by going, going to the B Corp, it allows us to use a structure that everybody's comfortable with. Um, we're investing in businesses. We're really funding, we're really operating like a finance company, a private equity firm or whatever. So we might as well adopt that DNA and yet we don't have to, we don't have to be driven by making a profit. And so for us, it was an easy fit. It was almost uncontroversial once we all got to that point. My question is for Professor Bradford. What do you think is the role that policy should play when taking clean energy to the bottom of the pyramid? Well, uh, um, thank you. Um, I uh, again, I'm probably the least informed person on the on the panel to answer that, but they've all taken a shot at it. I, I mean, I think the best I can do is probably summarize what they said, which is the problem. The problem isn't in the technology. The problem, and so we don't need to incentivize new technologies. It's not to say that we don't need to, to understand the adoption of, say, next generation lithium ion batteries or nickel metal hydride batteries to replace. Um, the uh, the lead acid batteries that that have sort of a uh, they've sort of hit their limit in terms of cost reduction lifetime performance and they may not be they may not we may not be able to extend the the value offering with that technology pathway but I mean those are but those technology um, um, investments aren't necessarily going to happen in the in the uh, uh, developing world, they're going to happen in other places where they can get the scale to justify those investments. So I think if you're thinking about the policy interventions in the in in the world to to sort of it's not about um, necessarily even finance, although I think if you extend the what it is about, which is business processes, rule of law, um, you know, contract enforcement, um, those would definitely help the certainty around finance. And and of course, if you can, if you have more certainty around finance, and you have 
robust technologies, you can amortize them over longer periods of time and bring down the cost. But again, cost isn't really the problem. The problem is, um, is certainty. Uh, the problem is uh, making sure that there's no hidden taxes and making sure that when you go into the marketplace that you're not up against a huge um, 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 otherwise subsidized co uh, uh, competitor. Uh, those are going to be very hard to do, so I'm, those are not easy interventions to make in some case. But it is around, um, it, it's sort of beyond the existence of the initial product and the finance offering and before the customer. It's, so it's everything in that distribution chain. And like I said, it, that, that we have, this is not a dissimilar problem. If you look at the solar debate in the United States right now, it's, we, the, we've, we've sort of won the battle in terms of cheap modules. It, it, it just... It, 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 we, we're, we're there. They, beyond what anybody thought we would be just years, a few years ago in terms of cost. And so the entire debate has shifted to um, um, uh, uh, driving costs out of the balance of systems, which is really the same thing as saying, what does it take to find the customer, sell the customer, deliver the customer, and ensure the customer that that will be delivered um, consistently over the life of the system. Same with energy efficiency. For years we've been looking at energy efficiency solutions as being cost effective. It's always been a business model problem and allocating risks and information correctly. So I think that these are, the, it's, it, it, to me it's, it's great news that, the, that people generally recognize that the customer value proposition is there and we can just work on the deployment issues. Um, so yes, next. Hi, thank you. Um, my name is Gabriela, and I work uh, for Copernic. It's a nonprofit that brings technologies to developing countries. Also working with Delight. Uh, my question is, um, as I'm just questioning about how the sustainability of these products that are, that are coming from abroad, because now. Um, the governments, also like a lot of uh, organizations are trying to maximize uh, the resources, assets that are available in uh, locally. So instead of bringing products, products from outside, maximizing just the product, using uh, making products uh, using the, low, the assets that are available already. So um, will there be, a, do you think there will there be a competition or um, uh, threats to products that can be produced loca locally when there are so many products like delights and others that are coming from abroad? Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's a really uh, an important issue. And we've, we've worked with entrepreneurs that have kind of weighed this decision about where to produce the product. Because uh, obviously local production has advantages and you've raised the tariff issue. Obviously as a social enterprise, the idea of creating local employment is valuable. Uh, maybe your supply chain is more reliable in some ways. But at the end of the day, I think for D-Light in particular, thinking about how to create a truly innovative product in terms of being absolutely as low cost as possible and taking advantage of the reduction in cost of certain components, um, they you know, made the decision to manufacture in China that would allow them to sort of pursue that business plan, and it achieves maybe different ends. So I don't think it's sort of an either or, that there's one right answer. Um, and I think it's a little bit of a controversial question because you know we, we work with a manufacturer of bed nets in Tanzania. The fact that they manufacture the nets in Africa means that they're employing 7,000 women um, who are gonna have a different sort of set of opportunities ahead of them. Uh, so I think it's something that people should consider carefully, but I don't think the right answer is always local, 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 because if your idea is to penetrate the market with an intervention like clean, safe lighting that has these other benefits, you have to weigh all of that um, against the other benefits of producing locally, which both, again, I think have the social impact benefits of local employment um, and using local assets, but also these issues of tariffs um, and the uncertainty of, of kind of import and export markets. I think very often it's also a false debate. Uh, it's a false trade-off because it really depends on the level of technology and the, and the complexity of the technology, mm -hmm. right? So uh, imagine what would have happened. I mean, mobile phones are probably the most transformative or have been the most, one of the most transformative technologies for the base of the pyramid over the last decade. Uh, imagine what would have happened if uh, tariffs would have been, were at such a level that importation of mobile phones would, be, would have been too expensive, right? And the people actually waited for an Africa-made phone, right? The people would have lost 10 years. Uh, but, but so if you look at technologies that are that are simpler, and I'm not talking about just bed nets, which are you know uh, uh, maybe technically unsophisticated, but even uh, improved cook stoves, you are seeing actually a lot of uh, social enterprises opening manufacturing facilities in Africa because the cook stove does not have electronic many electronic components. Some of them actually do have electronic components, but they don't have many electronic components. So Philips has just opened a factory in Lesotho. Um, uh, GE is considering opening, uh, doing cookstove manufacturing in, in Africa. 
EnviroFit has just opened a huge manufacturing facility in Nairobi. So you are seeing that happen, but it really depends on the technology. Yeah, maybe one more up here. Thank you. Um, so thank you very much. You talk a lot about social entrepreneurs um, in this uh, sector, but not so much about the global uh, companies. And for instance, like Total, Schneider, Electrics, Philips are moving into like solar energy and uh, cook stoves. So I was wondering what was your uh, vision on the role of uh, big companies, big corporations versus social entrepreneurs uh, in this field? That's great. Yeah. Well, I, I was talking about social entrepreneurs because I thought that's, that, that would be mostly the people in the audience. Uh, I think there is a there is definitely a message here with the, for the multinationals. So yes, Schneider, Total, uh, Philips, and others are scaling up in the market, and uh, that actually is huge impact already, right? So so in theory, their potential to take things to scale is much higher once someone else figures out how to solve how to solve the the finds the appropriate technology and other things. It's much easier for these huge multi multinational corps to buy the technology or, or replicate an existing model than to create it from scratch. Because the incentives internally in, in uh, base of the pyramid innovation are, are in fru or frugal design are not there for most, for most of them. But I, I do think there's a lot of potential for them. Um, uh, and, uh, and frankly, I've been in conversations with quite a few of them and we've, we've actually helped some of, the, some of the companies you mentioned on their strategies for these markets. And it, it sort of riles them up that they, when they look at the people who is actually getting a lot of scale, it's not them. It's a, it's a tiny, it's a delight, right? So, so they are going to invest more. They are moving more towards towards this area, and they are shifting their mindset from CSR to more BOP product design, which which I think is very promising. Yeah, and I would just, I mean, I sort of have to smile because in the conversations I've had with companies, not just in um, energy, but I've talked to them more in water areas, um, we're still talking about. I mean, again, despite these success stories, such minimal penetration among markets that remain very difficult to serve. I mean, any of the companies that we're talking about are companies that are in the throes of tremendous challenges. And they are, they are working so hard to learn so fast to achieve success. But they're not coasting along being like, wow, we're selling so much product and we're making so much money. They're still fighting every day. And it's just funny to think of companies sort of watching them, trying to figure out when does it get big enough to replicate it, oh, well, now we'll throw $10 million at it and we'll do it too, or buy it. Um, but I think they just operate on a different set of motivations. Um, so, you know, it's, there's an, some irony there because I think big companies could do a lot of this very, very quickly if they wanted to put the money into it. But the idea of getting returns on a, on a large investment 10 years later, who, whose business plan is that inside a large company? Um, so I think that that's a, an internal challenge. Well, and with some of them, I think they recognize, they've learned that um, they're not good at it, which is what what both of my colleagues on the panel are saying. Uh, I know, for example, that in, uh, in LPG gas distribution in Tanzania, uh, BP pulled out of the market. Mm -hmm. It just was too hard for them. Um, we think it's a really hard market, too. There's a growing need because that's really the next step up the cooking ladder if you can get people off of cook stoves. Uh, in Ghana, if my memory serves, uh, many years ago, Total was in the market and they pulled out. It's all local businesses now. Eventually, eventually, the market will grow big enough. We hope it'll grow big enough that international players will be interested. At that time, we at that point, we expect the local players to be pretty strong players, and doesn't mean they'll necessarily survive. But there'll be some there'll be some interesting opportunities for, for entrepreneurs to to um, to really be successful. And I've seen procurement um, of uh, of things like um, um, elect grid management services uh, by. Uh, um, governments in Africa and uh, other other locations for for international cert, you know sort of um, um, uh, managers to come and do this and instead of actually setting up the procurement to deliver grid services to blank it's to deliver grid electric or to deliver electricity to blank and giving those international um, sort of technical um, uh, organizations licensed to come up with solutions that look more like microgrids or storage supported or or in some cases why you know highly distributed solutions and so um, so there are ways to probably get at that that, that provide some protection but uh, but certainly they have the scale to do that so I think we're out of time unfortunately a lot of people for a lot of reasons will be mad at me if we go over um, including uh, my students who are waiting for me over on the other side of campus but anyway help me uh, thank this wonderful panel for their insights today <laughs>